Welcome to Real News, folks. It's Mark Steiner. Great to have you all with us once again. You know, when you hear the word white-collar crime, well, at least for me, it conjures up images of crusading investigators and prosecutors going after corrupt corporations. It works great as a Hollywood script, but the reality we face is that white-collar prosecutions could end up at their lowest percentage of federally prosecuted crimes since 1986. Though those prosecutions went up in 2011, they still went down collectively under Obama, but if you take immigrant cases out of the picture, it's plummeting even more precipitously under Trump. I mean, only 3% of over 170,000 federal prosecutions were for white-collar crimes under him. And most of those were not business leaders. So what is happening here? What is going on? Well, the man who wrote the book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, joined us once again. He's a former federal financial regulator, white-collar criminologist, and associate professor of economics and law at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And as a continuing guest here at The Real News, Bill Black, welcome back. Thank you. So what is happening here? I mean, it seems that this is, I think most people look at this and go, you know, they, they just take it for granted that if you're a member of a corporation, that if you violated the public trust, that if you have uh, caused the uh, uh, housing market to plummet, if your bank is money laundering for, for criminals and terrorists around the globe, it's okay. You'll get a fine, but you got to keep on going. What, to give us, what, what is happening now that's different from before? <laughs> well, Part of the answer is it, it is going like before. In other words, we're looking <laughs> at a very long-term trend. And the very long-term trend is we've decided as a society implicitly that elite uh, white-collar crimes will pay, and they'll pay spectacularly well with uh, incredibly low and ever-diminishing risk of uh, prosecution. And even if you're prosecuted, uh, it won't be you, the CEO, that's prosecuted. It'll be the corporation. What do you care uh, in those circumstances? And even if they go after the corporation, uh, the additional thing that happens is that fines have uh, dropped uh, completely off the board in terms of the trend line under the Trump administration. So, A, Trump is like his predecessors, including Obama, in the sense of having extremely low priority uh, in prosecution. But B, he's even worse uh, than the people who have come before. And the results are horrific for the nation. Of course, Trump wouldn't be president if we had effective white-collar prosecutions. He would have been <laughs> imprisoned decades ago, and that would have been the end of it, of the most corrupt administration. So it's demonstrating implicitly the cost of not prosecuting these people. Uh, and you're seeing it isn't just him. He's got a whole cabinet of corrupt officials, right? Uh, and as Sunderland testified famously, they were all in on it. You know, everybody in the leadership of the Trump administration was involved in the latest crimes involving uh, Ukraine. But well before that, more traditional white collar crimes, that's what Trump's been committing uh, for over 40 years. And his father was a white collar criminal. <laughs> so, so this, this, so his pedigree is clear, at least to some of us. His pedigree is very clear. Um, well, and his but, son in law's father was a white collar criminal. Exactly. So, right, exactly. <laughs> so they, they're breeding to create the more <laughs> efficient white collar criminals of the future. So, what I'm really curious about from your perspective is how we got here. I mean, whether you take a look at under Obama, there was $14 billion in fines levied uh, against uh, 71 institutions and 34 public companies. Under Trump, in his first 20 months, that's down to $3.4 billion in only 17 institutions and 13 public companies. So, and, and, if, and if the trends continue, uh, that uh, these, with these lack of white-collar prosecutions, this will be the lowest percentage since 1986. So what has happened in, these, in that time since 1986 and before? There's allowed this to take place, where they just get away with everything with the prosecutions. What are we missing here? What is missing here? Okay, so they're missing two things in the statistics that you cited, which yeah. are correct and important, but not as definitive as I hope what I'm going to say. Okay. Right. Um, so first thing is, a prosecution is not a prosecution. 
a prosecution of a corporation versus a prosecution of the officer, uh, a prosecution of the corporation is almost worthless. Uh, so uh, those Obama prosecutions were great for the numbers. They racked up lots of dollars, had absolutely no deterrent effect, were designed to have absolutely no deterrent effect, were designed to achieve exactly what they achieved. No banker who had any material role in causing the great financial crisis, and thousands of them did, none, zero, were prosecuted successfully. Two were prosecuted at all, and they were, you know, not tangential, but relatively minor uh, officials. The others involved things like LIBOR, which is a cartel thing too complex for right th this particular talk. And uh, again, that's a handful of folks, and LIBOR didn't cause the great financial crisis. So that's the first thing. The second thing is some of your statistics do at least emphasize the important thing. How many of them are, pro are prosecutions of elites? Now, as I say, it's really critical that those prosecutions, if you want them to be effective, be against the senior officers, the C-suite, the CEO, the CFO, the chairman of the board, those type of things, and that's not happening. But on top of that, under the Trump administration, there's an almost complete unwillingness to take on big corporations even. So they're not even willing to do the large fines, right? So it, it is uh, it, even the pretense of prosecutions is going away under the Trump administration. And in that sense, it's so blatant uh, that it opens up part of what's going on. Now, what was really interesting to me as a criminologist was the CBS story, which is the bigger one on this issue. So first, credit to them to at least talking about this issue, which the vast number of folks, including most Democratic politicians running for president, <laughs> have not spent uh, nearly enough time on. But here's the absolute looney tune part of this. So they could, of course, go and they ask the experts, but of course, why this is happening. But of course, they don't ask criminologists. They ask people who teach in law schools criminal law of white collar crime, which I do uh, as well. But, you know, so they come up with uh, answers like, well, um, the great financial crisis has passed and public demand for prosecutions uh, is uh, reducing, right? And then the reporters translate that to us as, oh, they must be saying crime is down. So white collar crime must be down and therefore prosecutions are down. Right. That that's completely nonsensical, right? We have so much white collar crime during this entire period the 38 plus years, and you could extend it uh, 80 years back, that we prosecute a teeny, tiny percentage, even 38 years ago, when the numbers were at their peak, we prosecuted a teeny, tiny percentage of these elites. So this has nothing to do with how much crime there is. It has everything to do with how much do we demand as a people that other elites, elected officials, do something they hate to do, which is prosecute people that look just like them in a mirror. <laughs> Pe so, yeah, so people that make massive political contributions to them, that belong to the same clubs, that they knew in many cases growing up, or that at least they have, you know, Fred in common once they, you know, they start talking. So that is not an, a natural act. You know, when you said that, uh, that uh, you, your vision was these crusading prosecutors, not so much. No, that was, my, uh, that was a little tongue in cheek. <laughs> I understand. But, but it's important because Rudy Giuliani, non-random person in white collar right. crime right. at the moment, uh, of course, only became mayor and only became famous because he was treated as a crusader against white collar crime. The truth is that when he came into the U.S. Attorney's Office, he publicly stated they did too many prosecutions of white collar criminals. 
And he doesn't pursuing it. He wasn't doing an investigation. You know, he wasn't some tough cop. A whistleblower. Yes, a whistleblower. Right, right. <laughs> sent information across his desk, and it made him famous. <laughs> so, so, and those are some of your favorite people. But just, let's take a very quick, I mean, quick definition here, because white-collar crime can mean a lot of things. And most white-collar criminals, people who are prosecuted for what we call white-collar crimes, are not corporate executives. They can be immigrants who, who, who fake documents. They can be people who have done other things, but they weren't, they're not people at the top of corporations. So we should be really clear when we talk about white-collar crimes. Um, it's a much larger pool of things we're looking at, and the smallest part of that pool ever getting prosecuted are the folks who actually own the businesses. Right, and we have virtually no statistics on the commission of white-collar crimes. In the blue-collar sphere, we have two super elaborate. One is the Uniform Criminal Report uh, data from all the right, police right. all over America. The other is a really sophisticated victimization survey. Guess what? It doesn't ask questions about elite white-collar crime, and in part for good reasons, because the most important crimes that we're subject to in the white-collar world, we're not ever aware that we were even the victim, right? So environmental crimes. So when uh, the Exxon and others cover up uh, climate science and do things that are going to kill eventually hundreds of thousands of people annually and millions of species will be exterminated. That never shows up anywhere. So you're quite right. A white collar crime is more common than blue collar crime, and it causes more physical losses, uh, more economic losses. And in most countries, it kills and maims more people than blue collar crime. And nowhere in the world do we bother to count it. And in Washington, I can tell you from being in the government, if you don't count it, it don't exist. And therefore, there is vastly less pressure. In fact, during the great financial crisis, the, both the Bush administration and the Obama administration put out press releases that said property crime had fallen to all-time lows, when in fact, it had reached all-time highs. Why? Because we don't count the really huge crimes. So it, 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 kind of wrapping this up a little bit here, I mean, because I mean, the, the, the question is, I think for a lot of people when hearing this, watching this, is what do you do about it? I mean, one of the things I read, I guess Samuel Buell, who's one of your colleagues in this field, um, you know, has, has, has written some of, of, about this, like limited liability corporations themselves are designed in part to protect people from going to jail. Uh, and, and helps push these corruptions. We don't know anything about that, these complex areas. So it seems to me the fix is not a simple fix, it's a complex fix, but there is a fix. Yes, it, and uh, I, we try in these things to do a whole series on the point. He's quite correct. One of the things we've done institutionally over the last 45 years is, for example, get rid of true partnerships where general partners had unlimited liability. That means if the accounting firm engaged in fraud, so Fred, you know, uh, did it, and I had nothing to do of it, but I'm a general partner, they can take everything from me. I mean, everything, the house, the car, uh, everything. And in those days, that fear of, of Fred was a restraint that caused people to patrol uh, their firms, and they were less unethical. I, I don't want to make a, you know, that they were pure <laughs> things. There were lots of rapacious things that happened in Wall Street 50 years ago, but it wasn't the absolute norm um, in which... It, the compensation system combined with the death of true partnerships has created what we call a, a criminogenic environment. And you and the third shoe to drop is when you stop prosecuting, right? So deterrence is essentially eliminated in these circumstances. The private sector discipline is essentially eliminated. And you can now, through modern executive compensation, and, and you're seeing this in a number of these crimes, you can, if you're smart, 
and CEOs are smart, you can avoid the conversation that sends you to jail. You don't have to say, hey, quid pro quo, I want you to do the following sleazy thing, and in return, I'll give you all this money. The compensation system says that for you. Hey, you do anything that boosts reported income, and you make a fortune. Hey, it's up to you. <laughs> well, I, and I think it's up to us here at The Real News to continue this conversation and have uh, some a real look at white-collar crime and get under it and expose it for our, all of our viewers and the rest of the nation to see what's really going on here because um, there are these crimes being committed uh, right under our nose and people just walk away and we suffer the burden. And I would say white-collar crime and predation, which is what we're both in white-collar world and economics now starting to emphasize, because in addition to this general targeting of the public, specific targeting of uh, the elderly, of uh, people of color and such, is also a major part of this story. Maybe we'll get back to that. Bill Black, I appreciate the work. I appreciate you always being open to being with us here on The Real News, and we'll talk very soon. Thank you. And folks, if you have ideas and thoughts about white-collar crime in this kind of area, please write to us here at Real News and let us know. Get in touch with us. Uh, this is something we really have to see exposed, uh, and uh, it is undermining our nation and our democracy, and we'll continue to look at this. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. Take care. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on the videos.